Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. I want to welcome you this morning to the Jimmy Carter National Historic Site and our President's Day program. And we have a really exciting program for you here today. Um, can't hear? All right. How about that? Better? All right. So we have an exciting program for you here today. And I want to mention several of the groups who are joining us this morning here in Plains High School Auditorium. And of course, first of all, I want to introduce our very special guests this morning, former President Jimmy Carter and First Lady Rosalind Carter. So uh, this is the National Park Service Centennial Year, and during this year we have a special emphasis on education, and I want to acquaint all of our visitors today with the scholars that we have joining us today. And first I want to mention that we're joined by two classes from Georgia Southwestern University, the Department of History and Political Science, and their uh, professor, uh, prof Dr. Berggren. And then maybe if that group wants to just stand up so that people can see you, that would be great. Again, Georgia Southwestern University. And we are also joined by two classes from Columbia State University, again, the Department of History and Political Science, with uh, professors Gary Sprayberry and Fred Gordon. And would you all please just let us know where you are? Thank you very much. We're so glad to see you here this morning. We're joined this morning by uh, State Representative Mike Chokas. And I wonder, Mike, if you would just let us um, recognize you this morning. Stand up and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, we are joined by uh, two classrooms this morning through our distance learning program. So if you look at the screens to my left, you'll be able to see those classes periodically during the presentation. First, Royal Valley Middle School joining us from Topeka, Kansas. These are eighth grade students. Uh, they're uh, brought there to this um, event by their teacher, Mr. Nate McAllister. And uh, this class is gathered at the National Park Service site, Brown versus the Board of Education. But they're coming in uh, to participate in this program. And we'll learn more about them later on in, during the event. We're also joined by uh, high school students from Boise High School. And these are students uh, in the class of uh, Ms. Monica Church. So we have AP government and AP comparative government classes, as well as student council representatives. And um, I wonder if Ms. Church can hear me and speak to me. We may be joined by a special guest in that classroom, and that would be former governor of Idaho, Cecil Andrus. And uh, certainly, we want to extend a warm welcome to all of our visitors here at Plains High School. So we have a special partnership with the not-for-profit technology and education inter innovators called Internet2. That's how we're able to have these uh, distant locations joining us today. And I wanted to thank that program, and in particular, their director, James Worley, for assisting us in putting this program together. And with those introductions, I would say that uh, President Carter and Mrs. Carter, this year marks the 40th anniversary of your successful 1976 presidential campaign. And we have asked that you uh, share your recollections of that campaign and, of course, any other thoughts that you uh, wish to share with us today. So let me turn the show over to you. Yeah, and we are really looking forward to hearing from you. Good morning, everybody. How many of you knew that there were elections 40 years ago? Well, I've been restudying what we did back in those times. As, as you may or may not know, I had been elected uh, president of governor of Georgia in 1970. And, and when I was uh, in office for about two years as governor, I decided to explore the possibility of running for president. And most of the betting at that time was on George Wallace from from Alabama running. He was a segregationist and had become very famous and was very successful in the previous election. 
back in 1972, and uh, the other candidate that everybody thought would run would be Ted Kennedy, a very liberal senator from Massachusetts. So my plan originally was to run between the segregationist George Wallace and the liberal Ted Kennedy. And so later, Ted Kennedy had some problems, as you may know, at Chappaquiddick in uh, Massachusetts, and he decided not to run. And then when he decided not to run, uh, about eight or nine other senators and a couple of governors decided to run also. So in 1972, we had a, a nomination in a convention in, in uh, Miami, Florida, and George McGovern was uh, chosen, a very wonderful man, but very liberal for the taste of the South. And uh, I think all of us governors wanted to be George McGovern's vice presidential candidate, but he didn't choose any of us. And so in 19, later in 1972, after the uh, convention was over and George McGovern was very badly beaten all over the country, uh, I just decided to start exploring the possibility of my running. So we had about five or six people that were kind of helping us plan, including Roseland, of course, and, uh, and a few others. Dr. Peter Bourne, who had been my drug czar in Georgia and was later drug czar for the whole United States, wrote a, a letter to me about seven pages long outlining how I might be elected uh, president. We never did say the word president. We were too embarrassed to say that. We just said run for national office. And you know there's only one national nationwide office, that's president. So, so we decided that, that we would run for, for a national, the, the national office. And uh, I still hadn't made up my mind about whether or not to run. And then uh, the most distinguished Georgian at that time was Dean Rusk, who had been Secretary of State under two presidents. And he was a distinguished professor over at the University of Georgia. And I got a phone call from him one afternoon and said he wanted to come and meet with me about a matter of, of importance. And I said, well, I'm in my office at the governor's mansion until about 5 o'clock every day. Why don't you come there? He said, no, I can't meet with you at the governor's office because this is an unofficial thing and the governor's office is an official place. So he and I had a, uh, I'd say a southern libation uh, on, the back, on the back porch of the governor's mansion. And the first thing Dean Russ said was, I think you ought to run for president this year. He was the first outsider that ever mentioned that. And he was a very intimate friend of the Kennedy family. And so it was, had a double meaning for me. As soon as Dean Russ got through talking, I didn't tell him that I was going to run, but I called, told Rosen that we just got a, approval from Dean Russ, and I thought it was time for us to decide to go. So we did. So we decided to run for president. And, and we had intensive meetings to decide what news media were important in every state, what particular reporters we needed to contact. Uh, we studied the rules of the Democratic Party about how to get elected. And uh, it was, there were about 31 states that had primaries and another one had, had uh, caucuses. And most of the other candidates uh, didn't pay any attention to me because I was, a deep, I was from the Deep South. And there hadn't been a candidate of any substance from the Deep South since about 1848, I think. So, so I started, but I started campaigning the day I went out of office as governor, and all during 1975, Jody Powell, my press secretary from Vienna, Georgia, and I campaigned around, around the country. And uh, we, we didn't have any success in getting recognition. Uh, I, I remember once we went to Massachusetts and then went out to one of the historic sites of the, of the Revolutionary War, and one, one uh, TV camera came out there and they said, why in the world are you wasting your time running for president? There's no way that a Southerner is gonna be getting any votes in Massachusetts. And I said, well, when John Kennedy ran for Massachusetts as president uh, just a few years ago, he got more votes in Georgia than he did in Massachusetts. And I think it's time for the Massachusetts people to pay me some respect. So, <laughs> so that's, that was the problem that we had. I remember we also went to, uh, Iowa, which was the first caucus then like it is now, and New Hampshire was the second one. And uh, in Iowa, we had a hard time finding any reporters that would pay any attention to us. We would look for somebody with a, with a scratch pad. We think, thought it might be, uh, might be a reporter. Sometimes it was just a college student going to class, but we thought it was a reporter, so we tried to get to talk to him. And one night, Jody Powell and I 
always slept in the same room when, he, when we couldn't get somebody to let us stay in, the, in their own house. We, we tried to get a free room every night because we didn't let, none of our supporters, the people that were helping us around on our staff, uh, were permitted to spend a dollar on a hotel room. They either got somebody in the, in the community to let them spend a the night in their home, or either they had to sleep in their own car. You know, so Jody and I were sleeping in a hotel room that night, and uh, just a double bed, and Jody was a terrible snorer. He snored horribly. So Jody wanted, generally wanted to have a drink at night before he went to bed, and I, I, so I went up to bed and tried to get to sleep before Jody got there so I could sleep a while. So Jody came in and woke me up for the first time. He said, Governor, I, I got some good news for you. I said, what, Jody? I was kind of asleep. He said, we're going to be on television tomorrow. I said, I can't believe we're going to be on television. What is it? He said, I, I'll, uh, 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 he kept, he kept fumbling around. Finally, he said, I'll tell you in the morning. So we got up, he said, we have to get up early, though. So we got up about 5 o'clock, got in the, in the car, and started going down toward the television station. And I said, what is kind of program is it? He said, well, it's a very interesting program. A lot of people watch it. I said, what kind of program is it? He said, do you have any favorite recipes? <laughs> and what it was was a cooking show. <laughs> and so I thought up my favorite recipe at that time, which is how to cook rough fish. In case you want to know, you, you fillet the fish and you slice it in, in pieces about like a French fry and soak it overnight in a real good sauce. And then the next morning, you dip it in flour and, and cook it. So that's, that's a really good recipe if you want to remember it. But, <laughs> But the people didn't recognize me on the TV show at all. But later on, when I won an hour, they showed it about every week, you know, three or four times every week. So it became one of the most famous TV shows uh, in an hour. Well, we had a, a, a good time campaigning around the country, and we weren't making much, much progress. But, but Rosen, uh, about that time, joined me. In fact, we had seven campaigns going on every day. I went in one direction, Rosen went in a different direction. My oldest son and his wife went in another direction. My middle son and his wife did the same. My youngest son and his wife, my mother and her youngest sister. So we had seven quarter campaigns going on all the time while the other candidates were mostly wasting their time in the U.S. Senate. And so <laughs> I visited 120 communities in, uh, in Iowa and eventually, of course, which was our plan, uh, I, I came in first in Iowa. And then the next one was a primary in New Hampshire, and nobody thought I had a chance again, and I came in first in New Hampshire. The biggest contest for me, though, was in Florida, where George Wallace had swept Florida the year before that, the, the, the campaign before that, and, uh, and he was expected to do the same thing this time. And, uh, and, and Scoop Jackson, a senator from Washington, was a darling of a Jewish community, so everybody figured that Scoop Jackson would carry the Jewish community and the liberal people in Florida, and George Wallace would carry the conservatives, which wouldn't leave me much. But I had support from Andy Young and the King family and others, so when we got to Florida, I, we campaigned down there a lot too, and I carried, I carried Florida. We never were surprised. I always was confident that I would, that I would win. I was the only one who thought so, except maybe Rosen. I'll let her say speech for herself. But anyway, uh, we, we came, came through Florida. And then the other candidates, there were still nine of them, very distinguished people. Uh, and they formed an organization called ABC, Anybody But Carter. <laughs> and, and what they would do was every election after that, like in Pennsylvania, or Maryland, and so forth, they would pick out their candidate that they thought would be do best against me in that state, and all the other candidates would drop out. And then, but they would go in and help the candidate running against me. So they tried to single shot me in all of those states. I remember Scoop Jackson ran uh, in Pennsylvania, and, and Hubert Humphrey, who was a better previous candidate, ran. Uh, he supported uh, Scoop Jackson. And, and uh, Jerry Brown, who's still the governor of uh, California, ran against me in Maryland. Uh, he was called Governor Moon Moonbeam. 
he, was, he had a lot of support from students and so forth, and they thought he'd do well in Maryland. I, I carried both those states, by the way. So we, we fumbled through to the end, and, and uh, I kept on getting delegates. One of the things that we decided at the very beginning was to run in every state. Because sometimes uh, a state has a law that if you win the most votes, you get all the delegates. O other states have proportional delegate assignments where you, if you get 20% of the votes, you get 20% of the delegates. But we decided to run in every state. And all the other candidates tried to do something different. They wanted to go to the convention and have it deadlocked and then broker for, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, nomination. I, I didn't want to do that. So I, I, I ran all out in every state. Joey and I visited all 50 states. I don't think I ever campaigned with Rosen except one day, and that was in, that was in uh, Louisiana and uh, in New Orleans. And uh, so we never hardly saw each other till the end of the campaign. But every weekend we would come home and we would share ideas about what was the most important thing for the voters and, and what we had, need to do. We had to be sure, of course, that we were all preaching the same language because we had seven of us all professing to speak for me and we, we had to make darn sure that we didn't say one thing in a conservative state like uh, Iowa and then say something different in a very liberal state like Massachusetts. So that's what we did. And we finally got enough delegates to get to win on the first ballot. And I became the nominee of the party. And then I ran against a wonderful man named Jerry Ford who replaced Richard Nixon when he, when he resigned under threat of impeachment. And uh, Jerry Ford and I never had a negative uh, uh, television commercial. We respected each other very much. And you know how much money we raised for our, for our campaign against each other? Anybody want to guess? Zero. We didn't raise any money. Uh, at that time, every taxpayer could mark on his, on his tax return if he wanted to. Uh, I'll, I'll give one dollar for the general election for president of the United States. So that's all we used. We didn't have to go to any special interest groups to get money, which is profoundly well, important still, now. It's still on there, isn't it? Well, now, now they, they contributed uh, $3. Uh, each taxpayer can give $3 if you want to. But nobody, no candidate has used that money since 2004 because with the stupid Supreme Court ruling, Citizens versus Citizens United, there's almost an unlimited amount of money that pours into campaigns from rich people, and, and they, it's basically legal bribery in our country. So the richest people can, can give a lot of money to a candidate, and of course they expect something in return when they get through. So it's totally changed now, and, and a lot of that money now, nowadays is spent, as you know, for negative commercials. So the Republicans hate the Democrats, and they still do when they get to Washington, and our country's divided, and people are polarized, the blue states and red states. We didn't have any of that then. When I got in the White House, uh, we were very pleased. By the way, the first uh, reception we had in the White House, 750 people came who had let one of our members of our family spend the night with them. So those were special friends of ours. They took us in when nobody else would, and when we couldn't afford a hotel room. So uh, that was a special night for us. So that's the way I see the campaign as quickly as I can describe it. And now let Rosen correct my mistakes and she can tell you what I see there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, actually he didn't say anything that I disapproved of. Oh, wow. <laughs> and actually he didn't give any of my remarks hardly either. So. Um, and I had a friend who called me just before <clears throat> this campaign. Well, it was after the uh, campaign started because it was when the, you were seeing people in Iowa all the time and, and uh, learning about the candidates and so forth. And she said, you played such an important role in the campaign when Jimmy was running. Why don't you uh, write down, as you watch the television news, why don't you just write down some of the things you remember, which I did. And um, I was so glad you asked me to speak about this because I had my speech already written. So. And I'm going to read it to you, and I'll try not to be boring. 
Well, watching the media coverage of the campaign for president, and especially the caucuses in Iowa, brought back a lot of memories for me. <coughs> to begin with, <coughs> I loved campaigning. I loved campaigning. I got to meet the most wonderful people. I learned more about my country than I would ever, ever have known. And, um, um, and, and I went in 47 states during that campaign, <coughs> all but South Dakota, North Dakota, and Alaska. So I learned a lot, you can see, about the country. And before the campaign started, the 76 campaign, I had campaigned for Jimmy for governor for a year. And I had a friend named Edna Langford who went with me um, in Georgia. And so I called Edna and said, do you want to go to Florida with me? We had to carry Florida. It was not the first one, but it was really important. It was one of the first. It must have been one of the first. Um, so I went to Florida. We went to Florida. And um, we were going to stay for two weeks, which we did, and um, to see if I campaign in another state. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what kind of questions people were going to ask me, what they thought I ought to know. Um, and I was, I was really, really nervous. But we set out. Um, and then I were going to stay for two weeks. We, we knew several people who lived there. So we made arrangements to stay in the houses with them. Um, and as Jimmy said, it was um, because we didn't have any money and we had to find somebody to stay with. And, uh, and that became easy because there were always people that supported you. When you got to a town, you could make some friends and they would have you spend the night in their house. Um, we began our journey stopping in every community, getting all the press we could by knocking on the doors of the radio stations and newspaper offices, and the reaction was always the same. I'm Mrs. Jimmy Carter. My husband's running for, gov for president. <laughs> president of what? President of the United States. <laughs> you got to be kidding. No, no, I'm not kidding, and I thought you might want to interview me. <laughs> and they all did, which was a big surprise. Um, uh, to put this in perspective, um, people were not used to seeing family members in presidential campaigns. I think I was the first wife of a president to campaign like that. And, um, every, and to my surprise, everybody was excited to see me. That was fun. Um, and I was getting over my nervousness. Uh, and I shouldn't have been worried about questions after the initial surprise of seeing me. The questions at that time. And later in the campaign, there were issues. But at that time, it was about where are you from and who is Jimmy Carter? What has he ever done? <laughs> uh, and we, but we stopped in every town we came to, passing out brochures in every place of business, going through every courthouse we came to, meeting all the officials. And then and I had a Florida almanac of Democratic Party officials. And we looked them out up every time we came to a town that had that had one, and I remember, uh, I remember finding one in his garden, uh, and so we walked up and down the rows admiring his vegetables, and we came away with his valuable list of names he had saved over several decades of statewide party workers and contributors. That was a real coup, we thought. And the whole campaign used that in Florida. Um, this, this would happen often out of the blue that people would ask me, um, would tell me they didn't know what to ask me. Even, even um, journalists in some places, uh, it was such a surprise to them. But um, before the first day was over, um, I had a list of five or six questions, but let me go back a little bit. You can see my page is right. Uh, we were riding along and um, saw a rural a radio station antenna in a field. So we drove out to that radio station. And there was one employee there, a young man playing records. And so I, I gave him my, I'm Mrs. Jimmy Carter, my president's running for, I got my husband's running for president. And he was shocked. I said, I would, could you interview me? He, he said, I'm here playing records. That's all I do. I wouldn't have any idea what to ask you. <laughs> And so I said, I'll give you a question. I, I, can, tell you, I can tell you. And uh, he finally said, OK. So I did that. Um, 
Well, before the first day was over, I had five or six, as I said before. Um, and they made the points I wanted to know about Jimmy, that I wanted them to know about Jimmy. And so the rest of, and the rest of that whole trip to Florida for two weeks, when I got ready to do, when I was going to do an interview, I would always ask people, uh, tell people, I have these questions you might want to ask me. And nine times out of ten, they did. And so over and over and over, every day, I was really getting my message out. <laughs> and we unexpectedly found uh, other ways to get our message out. One day, Edna and I stopped at lunch at a motel, and there was a, we saw a car in the parking lot with a press sticker on it. So we went in and said, is something happening here today? And they said, yes, this is the weekly Rotary Club meeting. So we walked down the hall, peeped in the door. Somebody saw us and motioned us in. So we were going in, and Edna said, my husband is a Rotarian. And I said, my husband is running for president. And before they could do anything, Edna introduced me, and I made a speech <laughs> to the Rotary Club. And then another day we were riding along, and we came to this huge crowd of people um, and cars everywhere, pickup trucks, big trucks. Um, we stopped and learned that um, we had come upon the weekly cattle sale. And this was great luck. I mean, it was great luck because we already knew from the courthouse crowd that the man, Buddy Neal, who ran the sale was the president of the Cattlemen's Association of Florida and a very significant political figure. And so, they stopped the cow, <laughs> and ma I made my speech, and then they, and then they started the, the auction right over again. That was fine. Soon it was like campaigning in Georgia, and Edna and I felt very much at home with the people we were meeting. Up early in the morning, working uh, until the evening, and staying in people's homes. Um, as Jimmy said, we did that because we didn't have any money, but it turned out to be a really good thing because if you spent the night with somebody, they'd get really excited about your campaign, become good campaign workers. We had all of this going on while, as Jimmy said, the senators were wasting their time in, in uh, Congress. Um, <clears throat> By the time we drove home, we had left a trail of newspaper headlines with Jimmy's name prominently displayed. Um, after a few days, when we saw our pictures, though we would have our pictures um, most of the time on the front page, but was little writing underneath saying that I was Mrs. Jimmy Carter. So we, we learned that if we held up a bumper sticker with big Carter um, letters on it, that we would have, then we saw our photographs and they had, everybody could see that it was Jimmy Carter, uh, that we were trying to get the name across. We learned the value of radio interviews, and this was fun too when people kept, would come up to us and say, uh, I heard you on the radio and I was hoping I'd get to see you. Um, it's getting, it was really getting to be exciting. And we, and we came away with a list of things to do in our next campaign trips. One was stop at courthouses. You meet all the officials, <clears throat> but they can tell you who the good Democrats are or in the communities too. You get to know, that's why I got to know Buddy Meal, who was the president of the Cattlemen's Association. Insist on front page of the newspaper. If that's not possible, <clears throat> then the news. Don't let the newspaper reporter, receptionist, send you to the society editor or to the woman's page writer. <laughs> that was really important. Look for large radio antennas. Um, that was, we went to every radio antenna we saw sometimes. I remember one time we were going to an antenna and we ran up on a, I was, Edna and I was sleeping in the back seat. We had a driver that had been assigned to us in Florida. And we were running up a kind of a hill and stopped and we woke up and there was a railroad track and a fence on the other side and there was an antenna way off in the, <laughs> way off in the distance. But most of the time, uh, we found people, um, the same thing I found in that first one, rural stations, people playing music. And they would always interview me. And um, that was fun. And sometimes we found fire stations. Ra fire stations have radio antennas. And um, that was a good place to be because they vote, they vote too. And they cook the best breakfasts. <laughs> I have eaten so many 
breakfasts in fire stations with streakling, fried bacon, and it was, it was good. Um, stay in people's homes, it works. Muster up courage and intrude. We found out when I went to the auction and the Rotary Club, um, people like it. Nobody minded it because we were, we, by then we thought we were something special being the um, wife and friend of a presidential candidate. That was something special back then. When I got home, I couldn't wait to tell Jimmy, we, we can do it. If I hadn't been looking at a map, I would have thought we were in Georgia because people are the same. And do you know I found that out everywhere we went in the whole country. People are the same. They want to be able to make ends meet. They want good things for their children, good schools, good church community. Um, well, that was a pattern of my campaigning over the country. And Iowa was my next stop. And I had the best time in Iowa. I would go to, at first I would go to a um, coffee, and there might be six people there. Um, that, that, to me, was a pretty good number. <laughs> Later they got bigger and bigger. But I had been working in our farm supply business um, for years before Jimmy ran for governor. And I would go into these coffees with farmers and um, farmers' houses, and I could talk to them about um, the price of corn, about what kind of fertilizer they used on their corn. It was so much fun, the eyes would get bigger and bigger. And then they'd start looking at each other. And I was thinking about that the other day, watching those candidates in, New ha in uh, um, Iowa. Um, I had a built-in inroad to those people that they would never have, <laughs> never have thought of. But um, I was in 105 communities in Iowa. You said you were in 120. I didn't know you were in more than I was. <laughs> it work hard. Well, it's funny. I don't remember the bad things. Well, I didn't see the bad publicity because I was working. And uh, most people were really nice to me. Somebody, sometimes you'd meet somebody who says, I'm, I'm not for you, lady. <laughs> I'm not for your husband. But that was not really often. People were very nice everywhere I went. I would get really tired. I remember being at press conference. I was sitting on a box and reporters were on the floor and standing up. And um, you get the same questions over and over and over and you get so tired of answering. It comes rote. So I was supposed to be answering a question and all of a sudden I stopped. I had no idea what I was saying. And I said, did I answer a question? And this man said, you did just find Ms. Carter. <laughs> I don't know what I told him. Well, that's about the only thing, that's what I wrote down about my uh, memories about um, the campaign. But one thing that Jimmy didn't mention was, and I didn't see, I did see some of these people in New Hampshire, was the peanut brigade. Because people from Georgia came. You do it? Good. Okay. I don't want to interrupt you, go ahead. I'm through. That was all. <laughs> Well, I thought Rosa might, might mention this, and, and, and she didn't have any talk. I didn't see her notes. But one of the reasons that I won was that we had what was known as a peanut brigade. <clears throat> and a group, first a group of, from Sumter County decided they would go and help, help me by just going to a foreign state and uh, in the snow or wherever it was and telling people, we know Jimmy Carter, we're his neighbor, and we hope you'll vote for him. And they would hand out pamphlets and so forth. And that grew and grew and grew under the direction of, of uh, Dot Padgett, who's just written a book about this and some other things. So we had a very great advantage over the other candidates. Uh, in the key states like uh, Iowa, of course, was one. New Hampshire was especially important because that was all during the time when the snow was two or three feet on the ground. And, and, the, and the Jimmy Carter workers would go around with bundled up so you couldn't hardly see who it was and uh, knock on doors and say, I've come to pr promote my, my candidate, Jimmy Carter. And then they would go to Wisconsin or wherever the other state was that was important. One of the most important <clears throat> problems that I had to face was the African-American problem, because people looked on me as a Southerner, and because I was a Southerner, I was undoubtedly a segregationist, which I wasn't. And so Andy Young was one of my key supporters. And I remember one time, I, I wasn't there, but I've heard Andy talk about it, 
there was a meeting of journalists and, and all the campaign managers uh, in Washington, D.C. And, and uh, the reporter, one of the reporters asked, how about you guys telling me how many African Americans you have on your staff? And some of them would say, well, we're still looking for some qualified ones. We haven't got one yet. Others would say, well, we've got one and we've got two. And finally, they got down to Andy Young, and Andy said, I don't know how many we have on our staff. It's, but the beginning of last month, we had 22. <laughs> so that was, we were, we were just completely in harmony with the African-American community. And later, when I ran for president against, against uh, Ted Kennedy, in 1980, I got 85% of the African-American vote then. So we had a good start from coming from the South. So those are the kind of things that we remember. And uh, you see, Rosen had a lot better time than I did campaigning. <laughs> but now, if you have any questions, we'll be glad to try to answer them. It's another thing that um, I learned. I could do things I never dreamed I would do. For instance, I performed reading Aaron's Aaron Copeland's A Portrait of Lincoln on the stage with a symphony orchestra in Baltimore at the reading. If you think I would ever have done that, I can't believe I did. <laughs> you did things. And one of the, another thing that's interesting is that I got to um, Dallas, Texas, I think, and was going to the country fair to have a, a picture made with my peanut butter pancake. Well, I never had a peanut butter pancake, but it was a good <laughs> chance for me to get some publicity. So I went there, and that, that's what people will do. They'll, you know, they'll say, um, they'll make a recipe, say the recipe's mine, say they're my cousin, different things like that. Anyway, <clears throat> um, I got there, and they had gave me a knife. It was a pancake with no frosting on it, with peanuts in the hull stuck in the middle and running out. It was awful. I mean, this, <laughs> this was a dirty trick. And then I tried to cut it. I could not cut the cake. I tried and tried. Made a fool of myself. But anyway, sometimes you do things. I mean, sometimes you have to do things you didn't want to do. How are you going to handle the question? All right. Well, first, we want to thank President and Mrs. Carter for sharing their personal thoughts and experiences. Thank you very much. So we have a question and answer program uh, that is going to come to us through our video distance learning session. And we're going to start with um, by introducing Linda Rosenblum who is the National Park Service Education and Teacher Corps Program Manager. And, who, and Linda will moderate that uh, program for us. And Linda, if you're ready, please go ahead and begin. Good morning. all the debates ahead of time. We didn't have any debates uh, between the Democratic, among the Democratic candidates. But later when I got the nomination, Ger Gerald Ford and I, the incumbent president, and I had three different debates. And I would say that those debates were the most memorable to me. We never did uh, have any direct confrontation between, between the Democratic, among the Democratic candidates. But I, I think one of the things that turned the election away from uh, the incumbent president, Gerald Ford, to me was 
was one night Gerald Ford was asked about about the occupation of of Eastern Europe countries by the Soviet Union. This was after the Second World War, and he said there is no occupation by the Soviet Union of a of a uh, Eastern European countries, and and he insisted on that answer. And so it was really the best thing that happened to me in the debates was Gerald Ford giving an incorrect answer. I think he didn't want to take the blame for letting the Soviet Union occupy those countries. So he, that's why he denied it, I guess. But he made a serious mistake there. But that, those we had we had three debates uh, against each other, and those were the most important. Most of my uh, speeches then were to college students, maybe 15 or 20 at the most, and, and to programs uh, on television sometimes when, when I would be interviewed by, by Walter Cronkite or somebody like that uh, when I got to be famous. So, so I didn't have any real outstanding uh, speech to make during the campaign. I, I might say the number one issue that I raised was when I was campaigning in Iowa, and we had been through a time of terrible turmoil in this country. Uh, John Kennedy had been assassinated. His brother Robert Kennedy had been assassinated. <clears throat> uh, Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. We had uh, been in a very unpleasant, unpopular war in Vietnam. Uh, our public officials, the Secretary of Defense, and even the President had told lies about how we were making out in in Vietnam, and so the people were eager for somebody to tell the truth. And I, quite often, I would have from college students a question, if you're president, will you always tell the truth? And so I adopted that as one of my main speech points. And I would tell them, I'll always tell you the truth from the time, from this day until the end of my terms in office. And uh, if I ever make a misleading statement, don't vote for me. And so that became my main point to be made to, this, to the public in speeches was, I will never lie to you. And that was a very important aspect of my campaign. <clears throat> Good question. I, I don't know about, okay. okay. I thought, go ahead. Please go ahead, Linda. Okay. Well, the game has changed from priorities. I don't think <clears throat> I don't think anything that was that I have described this morning that you've seen on television in the last few months. There's a matter of deep uh, dissatisfaction with government. <clears throat> There's an incompatibility completely between Democrats and Republicans. Every candidate that hopes to get the nomination for president has to raise hundreds of millions of dollars. And so the, the country is polarized. When I got into the White House, I got just as much support from Republicans as I did from Democrats. And so I had a very high batting average with president in getting my, my programs approved by the people in the Congress. And, and that, was a, that was a House and Senate. So that's, that's completely changed. And I think that uh, not, it would be hard for a young person to even understand what would be happening in, in the campaign 40 years ago. You wouldn't recognize it at all. The uh, candidates were polite to each other. They never condemned each other. We never tried to tear down the reputation of another candidate. You, you tried to te tear down the issues. <laughs> we, we just debated the issues. That's right, Rosen said. I didn't try to tear down the issues, but I, I did. Uh, Different with them. I, t I tried to show where I would be better than they. I, I was lucky enough to have served in the military service. I was uh, in submarines. I was a nuclear engineer, so I had a good education. Uh, I had been on the county school board in Sumter County before I went uh, to be governor. And I had been the governor of a, of a great state. I had traveled a lot overseas. So I had a lot of things on, on my behalf, and I was a, I was a farmer. And, and the statement that got the most applause was, I am not a lawyer. So when I said that, everybody would applaud. So 
th those were the kind of issues that came up between us, but, but that was just comparing my past record as a governor and, and as in, my, in my other life with, with theirs uh, either in, in office or not. So we never did uh, try to destroy the reputation of another person. If we had, I think if I had done that to another candidate, I would have been uh, despised by the American public. They would not have approved any candidate trying to destroy the reputation of another candidate. So that was the main reasons that were uh, different, I would think. Well, the hardest challenge I had overcome was that uh, there was a general feeling throughout the country that anybody that had been the governor of a deep south state was uh, very conservative on the race issue. And we had had segregation in our country for 100 years after the war between the states or the Civil War. That was over in, in 1865, and it was in the 1860s that J Lyndon Johnson finally got the Voting Rights Act passed. And, and I think it, at the act, when that happened, there was kind of a sigh of relief by the American people. They didn't want to see the race issue re-injected into, into the campaign. And so that was the main thing I had to overcome. I had to sh show the people that I was not a racist and that I had reached out throughout my early career as governor and so forth uh, to the people of all, all, of all types. In fact, when I made my governor's inaugural speech in 1971, in January, my main speech was that I, I've traveled this state as much as anybody ever has, and I tell you quite frankly that the time for racial discrimination is over. And never again should a black child be deprived of an equal right to education, to health care, and to the qualities of life. So I had a good record in the past, but that was a, a record that was existed in Georgia, and it didn't exist in other states in the country. That was the biggest handicap I had to overcome. Maybe my husband had a different one. Uh, my greatest challenge was to get the press to take me seriously. I remember the first meet the press, I was on, I was excited about being there, being able to talk about the issues and about Jimmy. And I got questions like, wouldn't you rather be traveling around Europe than doing this? Uh, uh, do you ever do any cooking? I, it, it was really hard that the people and the um, local people wanted to know all about me and Jimmy and um, the, what, like, he was running, um, what he, why he was running and those kinds of things. But it was really hard for me to get the press. They finally realized that I knew what was going on, so it, 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 it didn't take them very long. That's an almost impossible thing to do in this country because all of the incumbent members of Congress, as well as the governors and presidents, now owe their position in office to large contributions, and they don't want to give it up. And so an incumbent member of Congress who will have to change the law if it ever is changed would we'll have to give up that opportunity to have a, a higher priority for a rich person to give a contribution to, to him or her than it is to give a contribution to some unknown person to run against the incumbent. Uh, I don't think the Supreme Court is going to change the, the Citizens United ruling, which said that a, a corporation is the same as a, as a person, uh, until the Supreme Court is changed. And it's going to be very difficult to get a majority on the Supreme Court that would, that would correct that t terrible mistake they have made. So I don't see any real possibility of getting rid of, of money. Uh, when, when, I, when we, the Carter Center now monitors elections all over the world, and one of the 
basic things we demand is that every candidate who qualifies to run for office has to have equal rights, equal rights to television and radio. And so that would not make the America even qualified for the Carter Senator Monitor election here. We also demand, by the way, that there be one central election uh, commission that would pass the rules and regulations for our elections. And we have about 444 of them, I think. Every county has its own election procedures. And so that's another reason why America has now one of the poorest democratic systems, I think, of all the developed nations in the world. And it's primarily because of, of money. Poor again. I think I saw Cecil Andrews sitting there. Did I see Cecil Andrews sitting there? Yes, sir. I, I believe you do. I'd say so. <laughs> I'd say so. Mrs. Carter, it's great to see you again, my friend. And I'm just tickled to death that uh, you have overcome that challenge that you had with the cancer and that we can still benefit from your knowledge. Thank you for being here and helping these kids. Thank you, Cecil. Thank you. Cecil. <laughs> Cecil Andrews was, was, a, was the governor of uh, Idaho when I was governor, and I asked him to be my secretary of uh, Interior in charge of all the national park system, and it was Cecil Andrews that was really responsible for the Alaska Lands Bill, which doubled the total size of our national parks and tripled the size of all of our wilderness areas in history. So because of Cecil Andrews, our national park system is now twice as large as it was before he and I went into the, the White House area. It actually drew us closer together because we had one goal <clears throat> and we worked toward that one goal and we always we always felt like we could do it and um, I, um, I felt good because I felt like I was helping I felt like um, he couldn't have won without me <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> so it's kind of bonded us I think it bonded us also. When we moved into the White House, uh, both of our, two of our sons and Amy moved into the White House with us. So we had a very good family affair there. Amy was just nine years old. And so it was a wonderful occasion for us to govern the country, I think, using the wisdom and advice and so forth of each other. So I think it really brought mm -hmm. our family closer together. And we're still pretty close together. And we were so separated for so long campaigning. I, I was campaigning for eight, 18 months. Um, that's when I went to Florida, it was, there was still 18 months until the election. And because she was gone all the time and all the children were gone, and so we came together, we came home together. And what was so much fun was that um, when, even when our children would go out, when we would go out or when the children would go out, um, everybody, wanted to see him and shake hands with him and take pictures of him. So everybody just liked to come home um, and be together. We, it, was, it was really a family affair. So the campaign, maybe one reason we will be married 70 years next July. That's right. <laughs> We're going to get any from here? Uh, you know, we can do that. Would you like to? Whatever you want. Okay. Yeah, we have one more question from Roy Valley. Okay. Okay, what, our last question from Boise, I'm sorry, from Roy Valley comes from uh, Jason Lamigo. Jason, what's your favorite part of
Well, I was governor of Georgia when the Watergate scandal took place, but I think that's another thing that I should have mentioned a while ago about how the country was so dissatisfied with, with lies and cheating and, 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 and mis... I think that uh, Gerald Ford did a good job in replacing uh, President Nixon, but there was some doubt, which I never raised in the campaign, uh, that he traded uh, the pardon of Nixon, which was complete, for his uh, anointment as vice president. I don't think that's true. But that was some of the allegations that were made against him, not by me, but by others. So I would say, in balance, probably the Watergate scandal helps me be elected. That's a good question, too. Linda, thank you so much for moderating those questions. I think that we do have time for two or three questions from this audience, and I wonder if any of our scholars from Columbia State University, Columbus State University, or GSW would like to offer a question. Yes, oh, yes, sir, please. Yes. Hi. Come, come closer, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be able to hear you. Okay, thank you. I think everybody else in here would like to hear you, too. <laughs> Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Carter. My name is Chandler Harris, and this question is for both of you. What advice did you give Jason Carter when he was running for office? <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave him a good bit of advice. The main thing I want to tell you about, uh, this audience about, is uh, always tell the truth. I think that's one of the main things that people want in a candidate is, is to know that when they say something, it's not a lie. So quite often, as you know, some of our most, some of our presidents, some of our U.S. senators, some of our others have lied about things and, and gotten caught with it. So I, th I think it's not just a matter of getting caught, but just to tell the truth it takes a lot of political courage. And so that was the main thing I told Jason. It was to uh, always tell the truth. You get the same questions over and over, and if you start answering them differently, then you don't remember which one you've, you've said to somebody. <laughs> but uh, um, let's see, what advice? I asked him if I could campaign for him. <laughs> and I did. And we all did. And we all, we all campaigned for him. and. Um, um, I, I realized um, how much I had missed campaigning because you go to coffees and teas, you meet people. It's just, to me, I just love it. So I had a good time. Thank you, Mr. Car voice, President sorry. Carter. And Ms. Carter, do you believe that the diplomatic relations with the rest of the world has improved or worsened since your time in office? I think it's worsened. You know, I think we ought to have diplomatic relations with every country in the world that is, that's possible. And so, but we have a, a, a different opinion sometimes in the White House. We don't want to break down barriers between us, and so we, we don't have any way to communicate with those, with those countries. Uh, for instance, when I left office, we, we, my successor in office, Ronald Reagan, decided that we would withdraw our ambassador from Syria. I think we should have kept our ambassadors in Syria all the way through that time. Uh, when the Iranians took our hostages, I immediately renewed diplomatic relations with, with, uh, with the Iranians. In fact, it was my, my diplomats that went over to the revolutionary government that were taken cap in captivity. And so we have a, a, a lot of uh, countries in the world now with whom we don't have diplomatic relations. By the way, some other nations like France, they try to have relations with other countries even though they have a serious disagreement between the governments, or between the presidents. Uh, and I think that's always better because if you do have a problem or a difference or an argument, you can resolve it if you have a good ambassador there and, and, and vice versa. So I think it's better always to have a good uh, diplomatic relationship. One of the main things that I did that uh, is probably the most important thing that I did when I was president was to establish diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. 
We, we had not had diplomatic relations with China for 35 years when I became, when I became president. And so we uh, decided to do that, and I think it was, uh, was one of the best things that I did. So yes, we ought to communicate with other people even when we have dis differences of opinion. And I think it, I think Jim has answered the question sufficiently. I think diplomatic relations are really important. When Jimmy was president, we were making friends with, with uh, countries all over the world. And uh, real, it more, it's more important to be friendly than not to be friendly. And diplomatic relations can help you be friendly. Thank you, Mr. President, First Lady. Uh, my question is, do you feel that you received an unfair amount of criticism for the botched hostage rescue mission? And what do you think it says about the state of our country that oftentimes people focus on that mission instead of the treaties that you were able to successfully have signed? Well, I don't think I got uh, too much bad uh, press coverage because of the botched rescue mission. I did the best I could. Uh, we knew that we had uh, failed in getting our hostages released about 3 o'clock in the morning. I, I went back to the White House and slept a few hours and then got up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I went on all the TV stations uh, that existed then and, and told the people what I had done, what I tried to do, and how disappointed I was. And I took full blame uh, for the mistake. So I think in that particular uh, issue, uh, I think I was treated fairly well. But that was the main reason that I think that, that we were not <clears throat> re-elected was because I was not able to get the hostages released before election day. November the 4th was election day, and that was exactly one year after the hostages were taken. It was the anniversary of the hostages taken, being taken. So that was a major issue. But I was treated fairly. So I, I, I may not have thought so at the time, but I do now. <laughs> I, I didn't think so then or now. <laughs> so once again, uh, President and Mrs. Carter, we thank you so much for making this a memorable event. And do you have any last thoughts for us before we end the, this portion of our presentation? I would encourage all the young people to run for office. <laughs> we need good people in office. And uh, and I think you would learn a lot, and you would learn about people, and you would learn issues that you'd never had thought about before. And if you can't run for office, campaign for somebody that you like and get to know. Um, issues and things that are important to the people around you. And I would say don't, don't ever give up on our country. We have a great country. Uh, eventually the, the people's will will prevail. And even though we might be discouraged or alienated or aggravated at some of the things that go on during the campaign, I believe that in the future our people will make the right decision. And we'll see that the next president will do, try to do his, a good job so let's don't give up on our country. Let's just uh, participate as much as we can. And, and, and I, I agree with Rosa's advice. If you don't run for office yourself, get involved in politics. It's not a bad situation. And although you, you might enjoy it just as much as I did, or you might really enjoy it like Rosa did. <laughs> and, uh, but it, but it's, it's a lot of fun in the long run. And it's very gratifying. Politics is not a bad thing to do. Well, thank you very much. We certainly appreciate having you with us today.